Welcome to Zoom Out, the Byrne College of Art Practice-Based PhD Symposium 2021. I'm just waiting, there's a couple more people joining us, so I'm just probably going to go through those intros again in a few moments. Welcome everybody, please mute as you join. Good morning, everybody, please mute as you join our symposium. So just to uh, go over my intro again, my short intro again, my name is Dr. Anya Phillips and I'm the head of sculpture here at the Byrne College of Art and I work with the students on our practice-based PhD program. And you are very welcome this morning to Zoom out um, the Byrne College of Art practice-based PhD symposium 2021 with our current PhD candidates, Chi Chen, Kat Cope, Tanya Dupuyer, Kelly Klasmeyer, Robbie Lawrence, and Ling Lu. We're delighted to have you all joining us for uh, this symposium, which is in conjunction with the current exhibition that's on in our uh, Burn College of Art Gallery. The current exhibition, the current practice-based PhD exhibition is called Zoom Out as well. Um, unfortunately, it's closed to the public uh, due to the pandemic restrictions, but uh, lucky you that are here this morning, you're gonna get to see all the work in the exhibition and hear the artists the PhD, the practice-based PhD candidates speak about their work that's in the exhibition and their PhD projects. So I'm going to hand you over now to Dean, our Dean, Conor McGrady, who's going to finish the introductions and just give you some, uh, an overview of how the morning session will go. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia, and thanks everyone for joining. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, Great to see so many people. I see we have 52 participants so far, which is which is excellent for a rainy Wednesday morning. And uh, so very briefly, yeah, um, as Anya mentioned, this, this symposium has taken place in, the, uh, in, in alignment with the, an exhibition that is unfortunately not open to the public. Um, so you may be wondering, well, why have an exhibition if it's not open to the public? But a key component of our, our practice-based uh, uh, doctoral program is to be able to make work and to test work. Uh, so we've been in the very fortunate position as we're a small campus that we've been able to allow students into their workspaces uh, as, as small research clusters. Uh, and they've been making work, they've been busy, they've been working through the lockdown, through the level five, through the, the difficult year that we've had, that we've all experienced, uh, to generate work and, and to, to make work. So uh, we have quite a large gallery space for those of you who aren't uh, aren't aware of it, and even though it's not open to the public, uh, we thought it would be a you know a unique opportunity for students to be able to put work in that space, to test that work in that space, and to reflect on that work, and to have a productive discussion around uh, the making and exhibiting of the work in the space. So I mean, of course, it raises questions about audience and about exhibition, and maybe we can have some discussion around that at the end. So again, it is unfortunate that we can't, we can't have a full public participation in the gallery, but it's still an important milestone in the, uh, in the research that our students are engaged in to be able to put that work out into an arena where it can generate discussion and reflection. So I'm looking forward to seeing the presentations this morning that, 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 that bring that, uh, that give, uh, breathe some air, breathe some oxygen into, into that practice. Uh, we're also delighted to welcome Professor Rod Stoneman, who's an emeritus professor at NUI Galway, the Houston School of Film and Digital Media, uh, who will be our discussant. So after the presentations, uh, we'll, we'll hand over to Rod, who will uh, make some uh, remarks and lead uh, and engage uh, with the panelists in a the, in the discussion uh, after the presentations. Rod has been a, a longtime visitor, collaborator, colleague uh, at the Barn College of Art in his, for, in his former role uh, at, the, at, the, at NUI Galway and, uh, and in recent years as well. He's worked quite closely with a lot of our, our postgraduate students. So we're delighted to welcome Rod here this morning as well. Just an, on the logistic front, I would ask that if you have a question, that you put your question into the chat box. 
what, the way we'll work this forum is, uh, this symposium is, you can put chest, uh, questions down at any point during the morning's proceedings, but we're, we won't be taking questions verbally from the, from the participants. We, we, what we will do at the end of uh, the discussion with Rod and the participants, Anya and I will pull some uh, questions from the chat box uh, and we'll put them to the panel. We may not get to everyone's questions, but we'll, we'll do our best depending on the time frame that we have. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. And uh, I'll hand back over to Anya, who will uh, start the proceedings. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Connor. Um, I'll just remind anyone who's just recently joined us to please mute uh, your sound and your video if possible too, just to help our bandwidth. Um, and I'm going to start the ball rolling with our Pacha Kucha style presentations, which is for those of you who don't know the format, it's uh, 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide. So um, our practice-based PhD candidates are going to talk through their projects under those conditions or within that structure, which makes it a very dynamic, um, I think, an exciting way to encounter their work and their ideas. So I'm going to start off with alphabetical, in alphabetical order, with Chi Chen. And I'm yes. going to share my screen now. And... Uh, open up your presentation Chi. Okay. Um, and welcome you, thank you. And uh, when you're ready to go, let me know and I'll play. Yeah, I'm ready. You can start. Hi, uh, my name is Chi Chen. My research question is an inquiry into the ability of portrait painting and documentary videos to challenge subjective boundaries. And this is my second year in Burren College of Art. In 2013, I painted 80 veterans of the war against Japan. Seemingly sharing the same fate, they all had different life experiences. I recorded their stories and drew them. Some of the veterans are still alive, but most of them have left the world. In 2017, I spent a month in Xinjiang, China, driving 20,000 kilometers visiting many Chinese Muslims and interviewing their stories. Before the trip, I thought most of them would have the feeling of being oppressed and not free. But when I finished painting about 80 Muslims, I found that most of them kept their qualities of kindness, humor, and generosity, which do not change much because of their surroundings and its comes from their face. This is one of the children I met at Lake Salem in Xinjiang. He watched me paint and I asked him to teach me how to ride a horse. He was a Chinese Muslim, but his family lived in a nomadic life. I asked him if he would like to go to the mainland he said he didn't like the mainland. The people there are always changing. He liked here. Even his people had always been nomadic. His grandmother told him that their hearts were like the big mountains behind them. They would never change. It was these stories one by one that taught me the things we as a group of people defined directly are, may, are maybe not defined when we arrive at what we have worked so hard to achieve, it may not be what we thought it would be. During my two years in Ireland, I have been collecting and interviewing people who have immigrated to Ireland. And in this process, I intend to use this as the theme for my group portraits. While at the same time, I have learned that many veterans gradually dead. Several of, several of them I have, suspense, I, I have sponsored have passed away in just one year. And this silent feeding of life and the stories of their previous heroes give me great inspiration. So I intended to focus on the veterans in depth because it contains so many messages about human beings, face, obsession, 
love, hatred, killing, death, strife, authority, ethnicity, and all of this made me think of one word: evanescent. Evanescent is my second year PhD showcase. This is also the work now showing in the in this exhibition, which consists of two parts: portrait painting and videos. The videos compiled from a collection of veterans also includes clips of people who played a key role in the war. The enlarged and slowed down slowing faces combined with the slow surround of the second hand moving create a sense of the slow feeding of time and space. As a spectator, the viewer watches the face of the participants in the not so distant historical events flash by, while at the same time being a participant in each event in the present. The portraits are based on seven veterans I sponsored in Hunan province in 2018 and are on silk with light ink, representing the passing of lives and events in time and space and the uh, evanescence of the forces behind these portraits. Sorry, Arnie, I think it's the next one, number 15. The sense of feeding is what I hope to bring to the viewer, causing them to think about their surroundings, their beliefs, and their sense of boundaries. What we believe in, what is unshakable, becomes weak and short in front of time and space. But this does not mean abandoning what we have, but rather rethinking what we have. Putting it into a wider context of time and space is what we are holding on to the interest of the moment, or is it truly long lasting thinking? This is a question that everyone will have to face in their daily lives, in the past, in the present, and in the future. In the context of globalization and the community of human destiny. And these still motionless portraits that feel like they are feeding are accompanied by a video showing differences, different faces. They have all been particip participants in important wars, yet they are all disappearing. So all of the above is how I came to this group of works. It is my attempt at the stage. And through this work, I hope to bring the viewer to think about the sense of boundaries and their situation. I'm very happy to get some feedback from wider audiences. Thank you. A little bit faster, sorry. Great, thank you so much, Chi. Thank you. That was wonderful. Now, just let me admit a few waiting members of the public and we'll move on to, the, to our next, which is Cat Cope. Good morning, Kat. Are you ready to, for your Petra presentation? Yes, I am, thank you. Good. Okay, we'll go. My name is Kat Cope, and I'm a first year PhD researcher here at the Byrne College of Art. My talk is about my work in our PhD intern exhibition, Zoom Out, and the name of my video in the exhibition is Cut It Out, Suck It Up. This is an install of my studio um, where I'm joining you from today. My research asks, can building sculptural armor and repetitive action through performance become a healing act connected to the constructing of metaphorical armor 
to process unresolved childhood trauma associated with complex grief and adverse childhood experiences. In the fall of 2020, I started a series of blinder callers. At the time, I didn't know why I was making them. They came from my subconscious. This is one of the ways I approach my research practice, making and psychoanalyzing, much like Louise Bourgeois, one of my artistic influences. I was looking at bombproof suits worn by bomb squads. I realized I was making blinders when I connected the imagery of bombproof to the equipment horses are made to wear to keep them calm and shut out their periphery, thus keeping them from having flight responses. The wearer of the collar becomes unaware of their periphery and therefore cannot be disturbed by it, but they are also trapped. The wearer can be prevented from experiencing the outside world, a numbing effect, internalization occurs. In my performance, Cut It Out, Suck It Up, I explore themes of trauma, memory, internalized dialogue, and healing. The set is a recreation of a blurred memory of a childhood bedroom. It contains drawn and torn holes, wounds. Sheets of handmade paper create a pattern on the wall. They are imperfect, wrinkled, torn, with gaps and holes and spots created by drips called paper maker's tears. The inclusions of cut paper with cursive text recut it out, suck it up, and are sometimes tangled and backwards. The paper is an extension of the internalized memories, like posters on the wall. Paper also represents the fragility of skin slash flesh in my work. The collars are made from paper, as is the pillowcase and other fragments. Future armor costumes will also be paper to express this vulnerability. Here on the left, I make a sheet of paper. Um, the video is a bit distorted, unfortunately. In my exhibition, my installation was inspired by the video installations of artist Pipilati Rist, where she has installed videos in small holes in the floor. I chose to install my video inside of the collar I wear for the performance. Referencing Julia Kristeva's theory of abject horror, I pull a long strip of folded paper from my mouth, in actuality, from the inside of the collar. On the paper is written repeatedly, cut it out, suck it up. These words come from my autobiographical experience. They are memories which are internalized that I repeat to myself. Influenced by the work of Anne Hamilton, during the performance, I redact the text using a white paint pen to cross out the words cut it and suck it, leaving the words up and out. While performing this repetitive action, I chant cut it out, suck it up, bringing the words out of my head while I cross them out. The repetitive act of chanting is connected to my daily routine of chanting as part of my Buddhist practice. Um, there's supposed to be audio here. I don't think cut it's... it out, oh, suck it up, cut it out, 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 suck it up. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk speaks about the benefits of chanting and other non pharmaceutical, non Western approaches to health, such as drumming and martial arts all rely on interpersonal rhythms, visceral awareness, and vocal and facial communication, which help shift people out of fight flight states, reorganize their perception of danger, and increase their capacity to manage relationships. When I am finished whiting out, cut it and suck it, I am left with up and out. Up, out, up, out. I read up and out as positive healing words that indicate movement forward and release from the past. 
In the gallery space, the collars are hung at varying human heights so that viewers can feel as though they are able to enter into them. The suspended collars in the center of the gallery will be used in a future performance. They connect my installation of sculptural objects to my video installation at opposite ends of the gallery. Sculptural objects are remnants of my performance. The physicality of the objects in the space connect to the memory of the performance, bringing a visceral embodied presence to the installation. During the performance, I kneel on a pillow with a paper pillowcase. The paper pillowcase is reminiscent of a disposable case at a hospital or doctor's office. It is meant to be impermanent, but it is lasting like unresolved trauma. It exists in the present. It is torn and wounded. The wounds are drawings with soft edges, like a recreation rather than an actual bruising. Moving forward, I am planning another performance. This collar will be worn by the mother figure. It is created from a series of paper pillows stitched together to make the feeling of dark and rock. The aesthetic of landscape relates to my initial experience of coming to Ireland and to the burn, a protective escape. This blindfold will be worn by the child figure. It is created from kozo fiber, the inner bark of a mulberry tree that is cooked and then gently pulled apart to reveal the inner matrix of the fiber, then layered with thin sheets of kozo paper. The child wears a lacy blindfold rather than a blinder armor. They are unaware of certain aspects of life. The blindfold is created with wire so that the positioning can be more open or closed as the child is exposed to the world. The closo lace texture has the appearance of weaving, but also that of a network of nerves, the ends meeting together like dendrites, extension of nerve cells. This material fascinates me and its possibility. Thank you, and I am looking forward to your questions and feedback. Great, thank you so much, Kat. That was wonderful. And we next up, we have Tanya, Tanya Dupuer. Are you there, Tanya? Yeah, hi, Anya. Anya, would it be possible to have the full screen and not like presenter view? Would that be okay? I think that that's what will happen. We'll we'll try it now. Okay. If it doesn't work, just tell me and I'll um, X out of it and you can maybe share your screen with us. Okay. But just let me know that this works. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. It's fine. Okay. So spinning a yarn, a tale of undoing. The story starts with Hannah Ardan's proposition that to think with an enlarged mentality seems means that one trains one's imagination to go visiting. To learn again what it means to be a subject in the world, Ardan suggests. We need a playful activist perspective to devise novel navigational charts together. The fields of inquiry in this doctoral project include creative practice, eco-pedagogical theories, and practice. The doctoral, it, it includes the Anthropocene, which is defined as the age of man, and positions humans as a geomorphic force which has impacted on the Earth's climate and ecosystem. The theoretical framework underpinning the research is the Guattarian definition of ecosophy, a philosophy of ecological harmony and equilibrium. Spinning a yarn deploys SF, defined by Donna Haraway as speculative fabulation, speculative feminism, science fact, string figures, and science fiction. Haraway's use of SF, speculative fabulation, from the French meaning of fable making, is particularly relevant as both a lens and a methodology in the research project. Disentangling the ontological and epistemological threads amidst the crises and catastrophes of fires, floods, climate breakdown, extinctions, pandemics, and paralysis requires a radical imagination. How do we untangle the paradoxes of being together but apart? How can we be in solidarity in a multi-species sense? The vocabulary of the Anthropocene, the age of man, spins a story of alienation and hopelessness. 
the story tears the threads in the warp and weft of the ecological web. The Anthropocene is the last political scene, as Lortiger states. According to Chomsky, we are in a unique moment in human history. We are in this instance where this could be the final moment for existence of thought on Earth. We are facing a serious prospect of virtual extinction, he states. And who is the anthro in this contested Anthropocene hypothesis? What does it mean to be human? Unraveling the ontological knots of the implications of the anthro from the Greek meaning human being is to unravel a fable of species in full awareness of posing an existential threat against itself. Another term for this era is capitalocene. Deleuze and Guattari write that the ways in which capitalism captures the imagination from an early age and potentially commodifies the arts as part of this apparatus of capture. The tellers and listeners of the Anthropocene capitalocene narrative is a gendered tale of expansion, consumption, and accumulation. Mass industrial farming deploys habitats, destroys habitats and commodifies. Humans and their domesticated animals today account for more than 90% of all biomass on Earth. Identifying the gap in the research field, I look at the everyday and the very small scale and try to develop a personal interconnectedness within the human and more than human. By deploying strategies and practices of socially engaged and aesthetic art, my work seeks to generate pathways to move beyond Anthropocene and Capitalocene. The age of stalsalgia identifies a form of emotional and existential distress caused by environmental change. It is best described as a lived experience of negatively perceived altered environments. McFarlane and Albrecht writes, as bad as local and regional negative transformation is, it is the big picture, the whole earth, which is now home under assault. Rancière's concept of weaving together a new understanding of an aesthetics of politics and the politics of aesthetics engages the playful capacity of art to make and communicate desperate connections across different fields of inquiry. By deploying the strategies of a socially engaged and aesthetic practice with reference to the politics of aesthetics, my work seeks to open up a space to collectively co-create imaginative tools towards an ecological future. Albrecht defines the symbiocene as what comes after the Anthropocene. Symbiocene is a core aspect of ecological and evolutionary thinking. Symbiosis and its associated symbiogenesis affirms all the interconnectedness of life and all living things. It implies living together for mutual benefit. Now we need to stay with the trouble, as Haraway urges, to move beyond the horrors of the Anthropocene and Capitalocene to a Tholocene, where human beings are not the only important actors in making kin. For, and to quote Haraway, she says, for having an active trust in each other, in working and playing for a resurgent world. The order, Haraway states, is re-knitted. Human beings are with the earth, and the biotic and abiotic powers of this earth are the main story. Socially engaged practice and eco-art practices can help us to map routes to the future through learning from the past. Ecology, activism, and collective imagining can provide us with a way to turn towards the world. My research seeks to move beyond the dead end narratives of the Anthropocene, to come together to generate resistance and in an agency led imaginative response to bring about a symbiocene, a real revolution. My research playfully seeks to enact the principles of the symbiocene, among which is that all species, great and small, have their life interests and biocommunicable properties understood and respected. The doctoral research draws on eco-feminist theory and challenges the context and concepts of Anthropocene Capitalocene. Isabella Stengers, for example, urges changing the story, calling Gaia a fearful and devastating power that intrudes on thinking itself. Earth, Gaia, is maker and destroyer, not resource to be exploited, a ward to be protected, or nursing mother promising nourishment. Gaia is not a person, but complex systemic phenomena that compose a living planet of which we were one integrated component. <clears throat> the doctoral research constitute, const constitutes a contribution to new knowledge, 
by deploying creative practice to co-create pathways of solidarity across a multi-species and transgenerational community through forming threads of resistance. It aims to form a becoming with each other. The research aims to explore artistic responses to think through embodied experience of current complex and paradoxical ecological issues. The research aims to move beyond anthropogenic thinking that is a scene which announces its own extinction and is therefore devoid of hope and agency and to use socially engaged and aesthetic practice as ecosystem to imagine a symbiocene. Finally, the research aims to create a toolkit to generate imaginative and speculative and parafictional narratives and multi-species navigational charts to generate pathways beyond the anthropogenic towards the symbiogenesis. Thank you. And I look forward to questions and comments. There's one more slide. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was fascinating. And moving swiftly on now to Kelly, Kelly Klasmar. Are you there, Kelly? Yeah, I'm just getting my video on. Okay, great. And just let me know when you're ready to go. Hit it. Okay. <laughs> Art historian Martin Kemp has dubbed the human impulse to read the face of another, the physiognomic imperative. In the absence of other information, we attempt to divine inner character from outer appearance. This nearly 2000 year old Fayoum mummy portrait captures the face of a long dead woman. Who was she? What was she like? Hairstyle, dress and expression can each give information, but ultimately is the face itself we search to construct our sense of the person. We conjecture without basis in fact, but the physiognomic imperative is most damaging when it is presented as a science. And this pseudoscience has ancient roots. As early as 500 BC, Pythagoras was accepting or rejecting students based on how gifted they looked. Aristotle wrote that large headed people were mean, those with small faces were steadfast, broad faces reflected stupidity, and round faces signaled courage. Johann Caspar Lavater codified baseless visual prejudices in his best-selling essays on physiognomy. A pocket version was published in the early 19th century with accompanying illustrations fully interpreted by the author. It conveniently allowed the possessor to assess their fellow men and women on the spot. Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the HMS Beagle was an ardent physiognomist. And this is a man who re almost rejected Charles Darwin as naturalist on the voyage of the Beagle, Beagle because of his face. Darwin wrote, quote, he doubted whether anyone with my nose could possess sufficient energy and determination for the voyage. But I think he was afterwards well satisfied that my nose had spoken falsely. Literary historian Richard T. Gray's book, about face, German physiognomic thought from Lavater to Auschwitz asserts a continuum from Lavater's ideas to Nazi, quote, race science. Physiognomy as, quote, science fell out of favor after the horrors of World War II, but the physiognomic imperative continues. Humans still attempt to determine inner character from outer appearance. In face value, psychologist Alexander Todorov writes, quote, Faces don't provide us a map to the personalities of others. Rather, the impressions we draw from faces reveal a map of our own biases and stereotypes. Todorov's research has shown that the outcomes of elections can be determined by the appearances of the candidates. Quote, appearance has its biggest effects on politically ignorant couch potatoes, end quote. So what this essentially means is that the people who vote with their quote gut, uninformed voters are the ones who sway the elections. These are the swing voters. But how can we counter assumptions based on appearance? So I argue that story, which is a cultural universal is the answer. And the art instinct, Dennis Dutton writes, quote, people everywhere find stories intellectually and emotionally arresting. They are a way to enter into the mindset of another. Narrative psychologist Dan McAdams theorizes that the stories you tell about your life essentially are your personality. Presenting a story from a subject gives them agency in how they're perceived and provides a richer sense of the person. 
My project involves pairing a portrait of a subject I know well with a story of their choosing. The background of the painting and the wardrobe are chosen by the subject. This is a painting of my friend Sayla, and she told the following story at her 40th birthday party. My mother called me at work and said she had some cherries from her neighbor. It was a whole handful. I still have no idea where he found them. She asked me if I wanted to come home and have some or wait until after work. I hadn't eaten any fruit in over a year. I told her I'd come now. I wasn't really supposed to leave the office then, so I left my purse on my desk and slipped out. My parents' apartment was only two blocks away. I walked over and my mother and father and I shared the cherries. While we were eating, there was a huge explosion somewhere nearby. My parents said I should wait in the apartment for a while. We never went into the basement anymore. It was too much trouble. There were explosions all the time. Serbs fired on us from the mountains every day. I waited 20 minutes and I left to go back to work. As I got closer, I saw a crowd of people on the street frantically looking around. All of a sudden they started screaming, Sayla, and they ran toward me. I was trying to quickly wipe the cherry juice off my mouth when I looked up and saw a big hole in the second floor of my building. A bomb had hit my office. My coworkers were looking for my body, but only found pieces of my purse. In a normal world, you would celebrate that you'd escaped death, but then we didn't. You could easily die the next day. People and their stories are important. We live in a highly polarized age where we, we are each the other to someone in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, identity, religion, or politics. I, I argue that the human affinity for faces and the power of story can allow us to quote, meet and understand something of the quote other in the context of painting. But if the subject can tell any story they like with only their own assertion of veracity, how can one get to the quote, truth of the person? I would argue that whatever is told is the truth of the person. To follow McAdams, how people carve out an identity from the limitless potential of story creates something that is them. In terms of Bart's concepts of linguistic messaging, the image gives information the text cannot, and the text gives information the portrait cannot in a relay. Together, the panels function as an image text, a term devised by W.J.T. Mitchell to designate composite synthetic works that combine text and image. But a glut of text can be dawning. These are images from the current exhibition in which I'm using the journalistic convention of poll quotes to highlight elements from subject stories and draw in viewers. There is COVID conscious solo seating for a viewer to relax and read at their leisure. I view the portraits and stories as an opportunity for the viewer to quote, meet the subject. A white walled gallery with lots of text can seem like an assignment for viewers. Rather than an institutional or commercial space, I'm interested in creating a domestic habitat in which the viewers and the portraits can coexist with the paintings hung like family portraits. Thank you. And I look forward to questions and comments. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. That was great. And next we have Robbie. Uh, Robbie, are you all set? Yes. Okay, let's go. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Robbie Lawrence, and today I'll be presenting my work in Zoom Out. I will briefly cover how it was made and a few theories that might be applied to it. This multi pronged approach I will present is a considered shift in my studio research. Kubler-Ross is famously succinct in her breakdown of death denial. I cannot conceive of dying of old age at my home in my own bed. If I have to die in my unconscious, I can only conceive of it as being killed. Perhaps the most complicated thing to understand is that I cannot differentiate between the wish and the deed. In Zoom Out, these studies in painting aim to introduce multiple aspects of the research. One, a painting as a personal re reflective space, and two, paint in form as representation of the wish and the deed, or the impo importance of processing conflicting psychic imagery. This project is searching for paintings that aim to understand and ameliorate existential death anxiety, seeking to represent psychoanalytic theory of middle knowledge, a state of hovering between complete acceptance and repudiation of the imminence of death. It will explore the image in both a psychological and optical way. 
Visually Building with Two Versions of the Imaginary by Maurice Blanchot, Psychiatric Research on the Recent Phenomenon and Related Theory. If successful, this project will contribute paintings that focus specifically on the quotidian death and provide a space to think critically on the relationship with existential fear of death, dying, and the dead body. An important element of the physical nature of the painting is both the space it takes up and where it is to the viewer. Hanging paintings is a standard presentation with varying psychological significance to height and size. These paintings aim to encourage critical reflection by mimicking physical presence. The deceased, it is said, is no longer of this world. He has left it behind. But behind there is precisely this cadaver, which is not of the world either, even though it is here. This quote by Blanchot is precisely what these paintings want to build upon, left behind and with elements of them fallen away. From the beginning of this project, I have worked with the formal elements of still life inspired by historical work. In its current form, I am creating objects to paint. I wanted them to use elements of the void, preservation, and the body, resulting in a waiting shroud made from cloth and wax that I would paint and draw. It is important that these shrouds register to the viewer as hollow as they're waiting to cover you. While making test versions, I experimented with different fabric weights, colors of beeswax and colors of fabric, and drapery shapes that worked aesthetically and conceptually as both empty and full. While it would be possible to draw or paint these small studies as still life, I wanted myself to go through something psychologically similar to what I wanted the viewer to experience. To mimic the presence of yourself, I wanted these shrouds life-size. Here you can see the installation of the work and the difference in size between the life-size painting versus the test shrouds and selected studies. In order to continue to mimic the body and to promote the painting as your own space, I decided it would be presented on the floor so one might stand toe to toe with the painting. I experimented with different colors of background and fabric, working through how they function formally and conceptually. With completed studies, I worked on mock-ups of outreaching frames that might promote one-on-one -on -one experience with the painting. Each shroud is planned to be one of the various typical heights so different viewers can find themselves, so to speak. Here's a video of Francine casting me with plaster from the shoulders up. We didn't know it was important in order to get the drapery effects like the miniatures. So the first is attempt is essentially just using my head and shoulders as a hanger. Even if the sculpture couldn't stand on its own, I wanted it to be empty inside. I'm drawn to wax and cloth as signifiers of reactions to the void and the cadaver. Wax is used for food preservation and its materiality is eerily, eerily mimics the famous Rosalia Lombardo, the best known example of modern embalming. Cloth is a signifier of our own entering and exiting the void as many are born and died swaddled in cloth. The function of a life-size shroud of myself allows me as the painter to experience something similar to what I would like the viewer to experience when encountering my paintings. I come into my studio every day to my waiting shroud, which is also waiting to be observed and painted over an extended period of time. Side size is a method of painting that has roots going back to the 1400s. The goal of the method is objective as one can more easily compare shapes while standing at a distance. In this project, the use of sight size is not only for ease of mimicry, but to establish connection and presence when viewed at eye level. Unlike sight size, the method of rendering form used here is conceptual, not optically objective. Formally, using gray allows the eye to focus solely on dimension with no optical illusion created by color. It allows us to trace our eye along the surface, ensuring illusion, not copying optically. Painting in this manner is months of interaction and investigation collapsed into a single space. 
when the image begins to appear and the form pops out of the void like magic, that is when we might question where it is in its journey. The image flickers in and out of nothingness. The object I am painting exists in two ways. And now I am engaging the void and the neutral double. Death is not a problem or failure, but a great vague challenge. And I am meeting it with great vague process, painting. The flexibility of artwork is a potential catalyst to imaginative thought. And if I can use the familiarity of appearance to help steer imagination, the absent conversation about your death might appear. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well done. And finally, we have Ling. Ling, I know your presentation involves some sound and video elements. Would you feel more comfortable if you control that yourself? Because it can be a bit glitchy on my computer when the video or sound plays. You're muted, Ling. You're muted. Give me a second. Let me see. Let me open. Uh, okay, where is... Uh, okay. Will I share, will I let you share your screen? Okay, I can do that. Are you able to share it? Not yet. Okay, I'll make you the host. Okay. Okay, is that gonna work? Uh, let me, let me see. Can you guys see? Oh, thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Uh oh. Okay. Um, my name is Lane, and uh, this is my first year here as a PhD student. And the title of my installation uh, in this exhibition called uh, Yun. It's a Chinese character, and uh, the English name is Echoed. So my research project is um, dealing with rules of rhythm and how it works in Chinese aesthetics. This work here reference back to the research project and the research questions I proposed. So uh, this is a, an installation uh, which got like four parts and uh, including the sound and visual components as well as the um, interactive elements. And I think I will talk about them separately in this talk. So uh, the first thing I would uh, talk about is sound. There are four sound pieces here and the uh, poems and the lyrics from different dynasties using the singing of these poems to deal with the question how rules rhythm works in the spoken language via voice and sound. So, um, there's some uh, background info here uh, and some basic rules uh, for the poems and the lyrics and the, uh, the rhyming system, like different poems, like flood, rising, departing, and entering. And uh, in this um, show, I'm using one of the, uh, here I'm using one of the uh, sound pieces as an example. To give you a more clear uh, understanding of how those rhythm work in points and lyrics, you can see like this ping and the. So um, with how rules of, of rhythm work in mind, uh, my next question is what the voice brings into the speaking and singing process. So I did a lot of experiments with uh, the learning, recording and editing process to play with the voice. So um, the next would be the characters. So the evolution of Chinese characters is essential here. It is a totally different path compared to the West and the understanding of the um, characters and this path is foundation of understanding this project. Uh, these are the screenshots from uh, another stop stop motion video I made, which deals with the evolution path of the Chinese characters. And uh, here are two characters as examples. They combine together as the word boy. So 
in this part of the um, installation. Uh, it combined with a stop motion video and a interactive task. The video tells how the characters evolve and how different parts of the characters combine together. And uh, the uh, interactive task uh, with the guidance of the video, the viewers can use the cutout papers of the characters to combine the characters um, as, one, as the ones on the screen. So it aimed to offer the viewers a more direct understanding of the characters. Then we will talk about calligraphy. So one goal of this uh, research project is to articulate a history of the relationship between rules of rhythm and the, the expressions in vocal and writing expressions. So when we are talking about writing, we are dealing with calligraphy. So in Chinese calligraphy, the art to connect the seemingly random characters together is something we call rhythm. And behind this, there are rules to follow. So here in this exhibition, uh, we start video on the uh, TV screen on the wall. It is a 10 minutes long calligraphy writing video. As a video piece itself, it works as the background video to create this slow meditative an atmosphere for this whole installation. But at the same time, it is also um, a piece on um, traditional writing of calligraphy, which deals with rhythm in between the characters uh, in the traditional brush writing process. So with uh, the writing and the, the sound in mind, um, I want to talk about uh, the relationship for um, visual and sound. So if rules of rhythm work both in writing and vocal expressions, then what is the relationship um, in rhythmic rules in between visual and sound themselves? Can we visualize the rhythm we heard? So with this question in mind, I use one of the poems from the sound pieces as an example to do an experiment, try to draw the rhythm I heard in the way of writing calligraphy. And uh, here I listed the general steps of the um, experiment. So as um, in the video of writing poem while listening to it, this is the example I have been doing on the relationship between writing and vocal, trying to find the connection between visual and sound. And uh, um, similar to the other piece, um, there's also an interactive desk and uh, this desk with papers, brush, and ink on the side. The viewers can write their own reason they heard on the papers while putting the headphone on and listening to the sound piece. So in this exhibition, I made an installation dealing with my research questions from four different angles. I uh, tried with different experiments, um, medias, approaches to deal with my research project. So that's it, and thank you. Okay. Ling, thank you so much. That was fascinating. And thank you everybody for all of your presentations this morning. Um, and you were all very much on time and uh, beautifully structured presentations. So, uh, and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to the general public, members of the general public who've joined us this morning as well. And um, it's great that we have so many participants to our uh, Zoom out uh, symposium, our PhD, practice-based PhD symposium uh, 2021, um, which is in conjunction with the current exhibition, which is on in our gallery at the moment, unfortunately closed to the public. So now I'd like to hand over to Dean Conor McGrady, uh, for the next part of our morning symposium session. Thank you, Anya, and thank you to our presenters. Uh, really good to get that snapshot of, of, uh, of where the research is at the moment. Uh, so thanks, all of you. Uh, I'm just going to hand over now to uh, Professor Rod Stoneman, Emeritus Professor at NUI Galway, the Houston School of Film and Digital Media, who is our discussant this morning. Um, so if, uh, if Rod, Rod, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, 
Uh, essentially, and what I, what I want to do before Rod uh, gives his remarks and we, we have a conversation, uh, has a conversation with the participants, I'd ask you to use the chat function if you've got any questions. And I already see we have one question in there. And we'll, depending on time, we'll, we'll, we'll pull some questions from the, the chat function at the end as well. But please use the chat function for any questions that come up. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Rod. Uh, thanks, Rod. Uh, thanks a lot, Connor, and um, the presenters and uh, uh, Anya as well. Um, I'll try and keep it succinct so that the space for discussion, and I certainly would welcome, um, you know, the people in the dark auditorium um, firing in some thoughts or questions. Um, that's one of the interesting aspects of uh, um, the Zoom as a medium. Um, I just say uh, uh, a few uh, things about coming to this uh, uh, symposium um, and uh, a few comments on the individual artists work uh, as presented and uh, then perhaps wrap up by um, some general thoughts. Um, actually, I had a certain sort of premonition because four of the artists were planning an exhibition in March of last year with the wonderful title, A Sisyphean Task. And um, I dug out um, stuff on uh, Sisyphus and Albert Camus and everything, and was driving into Galway uh, on the day of um, having been asked to launch the exhibition. And I got a phone call from Connor saying, um, actually the exhibition's closed, the campus is closed, the virus has arrived, we're going into a very different space. So it was a very, uh, actually <laughs> the 12th, Thursday the 12th of March was somehow a very dramatic change, um, which uh, is still affecting all of our lives, I think. Uh, and we're definitely in a Sisyphean task at the moment. Um, I think, uh, I just want to say this is a little bit of living dangerously because although I'd seen uh, work by those four uh, uh, artists beforehand, um, that's changed and moved on and there's two others that I, I hadn't really encountered before. Um, and uh, so this is a very uh, sort of living dangerously with an improvised um, response. The other thing which I, I really do find um, slightly inhibiting and uncomfortable is if you have uh, a little bit of space with an individual who's made something, you can talk and explore and see how on a one-to-one -one basis they respond to any thoughts or, or responses that you have. Um, it's altogether more difficult when you've got, uh, you're talking about someone's work um, in the context of a, a wider group. Um, and uh, I hope it's not uncomfortable for anyone, including me. Um, the the small uh, uh, responses that I had um, over the last hour, uh, listening to the different artists, um, I think one thing which uh, Ki Chen's uh, presentation, um, I, I was just really uh, disconcerted by the movement between public figures, as in politicians and um, historical figures and villains and, and non-public figures uh, that he was addressing, um, because obviously there's a very different set of meanings that come once you throw up a picture uh, of um, Stalin or Mao or, or any of them, vis-a-vis um, -vis the individuals that I have no personal knowledge of. Um, and his movement into an exploration, um, I think, throws up something which is relevant to quite a lot of the different artists where, um, you, you know, a, a very basic uh, Freudian distinction at the beginning of the last century between the conscious and the unconscious. Um, is uh, used and changed in French theory by say Louis Althusser who talked about ideology vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, conscious ideas. Um, and ideology in his terms uh, is a category uh, of unconscious uh, perceptions um, and uh, the structures and vocabulary that we carry into everyday life. Um, and uh, that that is so there's some overlap, but it's not the same as the things that 
uh, we have to say when we have a political argument over s s supper or, or when a politician comes on screen or whether we listen to, if you want to spend an hour and a half, listening to two British royals talking about what's wrongs have been done to them by other British royals. I mean, that, that's the domain of consciousness, but within it are unconscious expectations and attitudes uh, about uh, men and women, ethnicities, uh, old and young, all the categories and divisions of um, society. And uh, I think that that, as I say, comes up with quite a number of the different artists and Kat's um, um, interesting work around a kind of um, a reference to a disturbing and difficult and hidden domain, which, you know, we've all had some form of childhood and probably, um, probably the word trauma is uh, not strange to any of us in different ways. Uh, and bringing that into focus and talking about, um, again, conscious and unconscious versions um, of, of uh, that exploration is um, something um, very stimulating, really. Um, I'm just whizzing on through and uh, Tanya's um, yarns that are spun, um, uh, this uh, uh, you have very upfront politics of aesthetics uh, involved or the aesthetics of politics as well, um, because it engages with uh, not just a slightly interesting um, political issue, but the uh, most uh, serious framing of, of, of our times. And actually, while I think of it, um, Tanya, I wanted to say, if you've not come across it, there was a, a Zoom symposium set up by, uh, I think it's the politics department of NUIG about a month ago, it's called Anthropocentrism. And uh, I can send you a link. Uh, if I get your emails at the end of this, please, um, Connor or Anya, I will send you know, any suggestions through to the individual artist. Um, but Kate Kenny, who's a, a lecturer in uh, NUIG, brought other people to bear in this brief Zoom, Zoom symposium, which I think was recorded so you can see it if you're interested, but about the way that anthropocentrism, the very fact that, you know, the assumption is always that we are at the center of this thing and actually the most difficult and and, and unacceptable uh, aspect of the predicament that we're in is maybe we don't matter. Maybe we uh, are a temporary tenant uh, of the planet and um, no one's gonna be too worried if we come and go. Um, and that's very difficult to accept because from um, childhood, we see things a different way. Um, just running on through, uh, Kelly, I've obviously seen some of your um, stuff before, uh, and um, again, the question of conscious of unconscious and unconscious plays into um, how we understand uh, faces. Um, actually, one uh, uh, interesting reference was I mentioned that before we started the session, um, a sort of invited uh, Zoom streaming or streaming of a film by Steve Dworskin that happened on Friday last week called The Face of Our Fear. And it was a film that he'd made in 1989 about uh, disablement and perceptions. And he showed clips from Elephant Man, from Hunchback of Notre Dame, um, from Freaks, the uh, famous um, Todd Browning film. And actually, he also named uh, half a dozen films by Hollywood studios that they wouldn't give him permission to show extracts of because they didn't want anything to do with a discussion of disablement. But anyway, the gist of the film is adjacent to your preoccupations because it's about the way that uh, intellectual and moral presuppositions are connected with people's physical um, predicament of one sort or another, and that um, um, disablement is read as uh, a perception about someone's uh, intellectual ability or moral um, uh, ethical stances, et cetera, adjacent to your work uh, in a way. Uh, Robbie, yeah, I've um, seen one or two of your things before as well. Um, 
I probably mentioned it already, but there's an extraordinary Stan Brakhage uh, film called Act of Seeing with One's Own Eyes, which he shot entirely um, in a, uh, um, what do you call it, where you do autopsies in a space of uh, dead bodies of four autopsies. And um, the question of the cadaver plays there. I mean, you see, I didn't really see your cadavers as cadavers because it, it's so vertical, the, sh the shroud, uh, maybe this is disavowed, but the shroud doesn't immediately signify death in that way for me. I mean, because normally uh, the shroud of death is, is horizontal, not vertical. I mean, it appears a ghost when it's vertical. Um, and if you want a recent reference in that, uh, there was that you know absolutely awful, disturbing RT documentary about a Dublin hospital. Um, you know, about three months ago. And one of the nurses just there said, I hear the zips of the body bags in my sleep. You know, the number of people that are dying at the moment and for a nurse in the front line, what she, you know, what the incision that penetrated her unconscious was the zips on the body bags. And, um, you know, I, I mean, actually, your version of vertical shrouds reminded me there's a whole series of uh, wonderful marble busts in the Prado in Madrid that uh, uh, I saw when, when we were allowed to go to Madrid, um, which, which uh, you know, have this uh, real uh, contradiction between the hard, cold marble and yet the, the faces moving through a delicate uh, the representation of a delicate material, um, you know, on on uh, a veil uh, of, of various kinds, and and you know, I some of your things invoke that. Um, just finishing, and then a, a a couple of general points. Ling Lu, um, I am very uh, interested to see your movement between a wide range of art forms and um, bringing uh, sound and the visual into writing. I mean, concrete poetry was one moment in Western art where the issue of the visual and writing um, was articulated uh, with and against uh, one another. Um, and actually there was recently an exhibition of Brazilian concrete poetry in, in London. But um, you know, doing it through Chinese culture and calligraphy is obviously um, opening um, the, its early days in your research, but those, um, um, those questions. The, the more general point, if I, try and um, hold it for just uh, a few more minutes. Um, I think, you know, this project of practice-based research, which I've always found very interesting precisely because it disturbs the formula and the controlled roots of traditional academia um, by introducing a tension of, of, of the creative and against the scholarly and the instrumental work of academic uh, meticulousness vis-a-vis um, -vis artistic work, which may or may not be articulate. And what I think is interesting in the reflexivity of thinking about um, the work that you're making um, is that, uh, and again, this is the conscious unconscious division because paradoxically thinking, con thinking consciously uh, is part of the process of looking at work that is made from the unconscious from outside of consciousness. Um, I mean, obviously the Surrealists uh, had a big go at that in the, in the 30s, but um, you know, the, the paradoxically, uh, some of the work that we've looked at in the last hour um, is outside of conscious mentality. It plays with chance in its material, in its use of materials, it's uh, improvised perhaps, um, and then, as part of uh, uh, the project of a practice-based um, doctorate, there has to be um, a reflection on the new knowledge created by that process or how it potentially can, uh, uh, art I, how you can articulate the um, explanation. Um, a second point that I wanted to make quickly is the way that, you know, uh, if anyone is a separate and isolated individual, it's an art college student, and especially on the loneliness of the long distant running of a PhD. And, uh, you know, I 
I was having a conversation with Connor a week or so ago about how you know everything else we do in life involves other people working in teams or living in relationships and families or um, all of this. Um, and uh, I think the issue of the separation hopefully can be broken down a bit. I mean, obviously, there are certain kinds of, uh, of doctorates which are done by groups. It's called natural science. You know, you get a team in a lab and they're all trying to work out, you know, the leaves on a, a, a new, uh, the DNA of a potato. I don't know, but, you know, they work together and they define their roles and um, it's a kind of collective process uh, of new knowledge, um, which becomes a scientific PhD. Um, I don't think I know many examples of it, but it also occurred to me, why can't, I mean, in a certain way, someone doing practice-based work through film is already in a collaborative context. Um, um, but, you know, obviously working in the way um, this morning, um, we've looked at everyone is separate, but there are so many connections uh, uh, between um, the six of you that I'd be very um, um, hopeful that there's uh, a lot of in productive interaction about conscious and unconscious uh, word and image and um, um, death. There's lots of connections um, to work through and hopefully um, uh, uh, the the Baron College of Art is a context um, for that. Um, I don't know, the last thing I was just gonna say, uh, I'm looking at my wristwatch down here. Um, the last thing I was gonna say is that, uh, you know, there's a, 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 a real question when an exhibition meets uh, a public, um, whether it's uh, through digital and virtual means or whether it's in a, physical space, and there's some big differences, I know, but that, that's the question of the calibration of meaning in that um, how big is the gap between intention and interpretation? I mean, um, in a year or two, in the last years of his life, um, Marcel Duchamp wrote a short paper, which I'm sure you can find online, called The Creative Act. It's just two pages, a talk he gave at a gallery. And, you know, in uh, that, he just said, um, well, these aren't his words, but, you know, he basically was reminding artists that most of the meaning is made by the viewer, not by the artist, by the viewer. And so it, to what extent is uh, the transmission of intention, the meanings that you have been preoccupied by or the starting points articulated in the talks this morning. To what extent does that work in the encounter with, with, with the, uh, the, the material? To what extent is the ambiguity of different for all of you, but the degree of an ambiguity in, in the work there. And how does that, how important is that, especially for people that are engaging with um, social, uh, well, I suppose we're all engaging with um, uh, a social as well as a, a, a cultural context, you know, whether it's death or whether it's uh, the Anthropocene or whether it's reading um, character in, in faces. Um, I think uh, I've probably gone uh, plenty long enough, and I hope that um, apart from you know this discussion here, that some of the um, people that have uh, uh, joined uh, the symposium will fire some stuff into it. Thank you all. Anyway, shall I mute again? Yeah. yeah thank you, Rod. Thanks for that. And uh, again, a reminder: we have we don't have that much time left. We were 10, 12 minutes. So I would just, I see a couple of questions in there, but I would really urge uh, anyone who has a question just to please put it in the chat. Before we get to some of those questions, uh, thanks Rod for those points. And uh, yeah, I know, I know for me in particular, this this dichotomy between the individual and the collective is, uh, is, is an ongoing debate, especially in the context of some of the research that's been presented around uh, change in relation to the Anthropocene and around e even changes in perception as well. Uh, so that I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of scope to to pursue that avenue of thought. Uh, the, 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 the historical rootedness of the individual and individualism vis-a-vis -vis the collective 
in terms of artistic practice and research. But I, but uh, in saying that, I just would I like to invite our panelists uh, to if, uh, to respond if anyone has any responses to or any questions uh, to any of the points that Rod made. Hi, can I uh, just to say thanks to Rob and uh, I or to Rod, sorry, and I'd be very interested in the link. Um, so if you could pass on my email, to, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, Chi, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah I think, uh, thanks, Rod. I think that's very important for the, the connection between the uh, works, between the exhibition and the audiences. And right now, I think it's uh, it's not just in the gallery. It's because the all world has changing the way to exhibit our works. So I think like the half, the half meaning of the, of the work is is given by the audiences. I think that's a very good point, especially for my works, because I think it's, um, I need to make some um, function in the society, in the in the world. So that's the meaning of the of my works. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rod. And I I think that's that's interesting that you mentioned that film about disability because. You know, I do think that that's very relevant. I mean, I've used as an image of Stephen Hawking sometimes when when presenting some of that stuff because, like, the story you know about him, right? You you look at his face and you make assumptions. You know, if you didn't know anything about him, but the story of his life and who he is as a person completely shifts your perception. So it's it's that principle of looking beyond you know the assumptions and information about the actual person rather than the facade that you judge upon is it's it's an interesting interesting point. Any other comments from the panel? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Robert. You're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Rod. It's always great to hear from you and your feedback on work because it's so comprehensive and your knowledge is so extensive. Um, I actually really, it's almost whenever you put so much work and thinking and you go over the same thing again and again and again and again it's it's almost nice to let it go to an audience in a certain way to know the like the true meaning lies in other people and not just yourself um because it can be so i don't know it is unconscious but we're trying to make it as conscious as we possibly can um so in the like nature of it all that it just like goes back to the audience for meaning. I don't know, it's, um, it is a relief in a way, I think. It kind of just reaffirms this sort of flexibility of art and the sort of difficult questions I think a lot of us are trying to answer don't have succinct answers. So it does make how we're working and the way that we do research it's like very appropriate for our subject matters. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, I just before we, we, we come to the some of the questions, I also just wanted to come back to this uh, because I think there's a lot of scope to discuss this, this sort of individual vis-a-vis -vis the collective uh, and particularly in the light of COVID and uh, the, the online situation that uh, even this, this uh, forum has taken place within. So I know Tanya in particular, social practice has been a core uh, focus of your research project and Chi also uh, this direct engagement with veterans and interviewing uh, your subjects, uh, uh, Kelly to a certain extent as well. Do, uh, how are you, uh, I mean, even just over the past year, um, Maybe you, you could spit some if you could speak to how, how your approach to the research has had to shift and adjust uh, with, in relation to this sort of rootedness of the individual, uh, you know, grappling with this project vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the, uh, the loss of the social or the mediation of the social. Or yeah. maybe it's not the loss, maybe the social is just digital. So uh, just any thoughts on that? Maybe Tanya, yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely um, has impacted on on how sort of the, the research unfolds at the moment because we would meet collectively 
um, and work within a space. And there are some people who are involved in the research group actually online, so they might be interested in in commenting. But I know that that for me, and you know, in speaking with people during the workshops and following the workshops, it was that collective experience that was really engaging and where people could bounce around ideas with each other and discuss you know very serious topics but in a completely different way and so at the moment we're, we're trying to do some stuff online but um it's definitely a challenge but then i suppose just trying to come up with creative ways around this you know to see um how how to come to a final stages within the research so it's it's an evolving uh complex kind of an issue at the moment Yeah. Any other takers or we'll, we'll, we'll go to the questions in the chat? No? Okay. Well, I suppose time is flying on. It's been a very busy morning. Uh, so there's, there's, there's two, what, there's two, uh, a question for Robbie uh, from Brittany. Um, sorry, let me just find this. Uh, Robbie, would you say, based on your research, that there's a difference in perception of, of death, of mortality between uh, Americans, given that you're from the US, and uh, Irish people, and how, how Irish and Americans view death? I would say that, um, well, I won't pretend to be any sort of expert on Ireland in particular. I can't speak for Ireland and their specific practices, but due to COVID-19 and funerals being put on the internet, I have been able to actually witness more Irish funerals than I had in the past. Um, and I did find a noted difference just in the eulogizing. Um, there was definitely a, the word death and die was actually used during the funeral and there was a there was a stress about being ready and about being home and being around people that you love and care about whereas from my own experiences in the states there's a it's a much more um don't don't make people uncomfortable don't be too direct don't you know there's a a sort of excessive politeness uh that becomes a denial of what's going on and what everyone is experiencing in the States is very extreme in my opinion um, and in what I've learned. But um, I would say that Ireland is very famous and from what I've come across in being one of the, for lack of a better term, healthier places to die and be dying um, and to mourn as opposed to almost anywhere else in the West that has a much more um, a practice of separating the mourning and the dead or the dying. Um, so yeah, I would say that Ireland does it, does death better for sure than the States and many other places in Europe as well. Okay. Uh, thanks, Robbie. Uh, Question from Austin Ivers uh, to everyone uh, on the panel. Uh, um, considering that so much artwork is currently experienced via screen, where does materiality live when we see art via the same prism? We chat with our family and watch Netflix. If anyone wants to take that one, Rod can take that one. Rod, feel free to contribute as well. Any takers? Uh, okay, on the, the I, I saw that uh, in the chat, and I, I just thought of two, two uh, relevant angles. One is there's uh, a leading um, experimental filmmaker called Malcolm Le Grice, um, who from the 60s was making abstract and experimental work in the London Filmmakers Co-op. And a lot of that work was to do with um, materiality, about the materiality of film. And that generated a whole series of artistic strategies. And he wrote a book a few years ago called um, Filmmaking in the Digital Age, in which he tried to think through the issues of what is the materiality of sort of almost non-material digital experience. And uh, the other thing I thought, I mean, obviously, um, 
people are probably familiar with the great 1936 uh, essay that Walter Benjamin wrote called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. And it was extraordinary uh, um, proliferation of of ideas about the change in which images are uh, and sounds are available uh, in reproduced form, and especially true after the digital change, because obviously the copy is as good as the original uh, uh, in the digital. Uh, uh, but he was wrong about one thing. He said, and the aura of live physical material presence will disappear and vanish. And I think the opposite has happened. The, I mean, I encountered some in the, the summer last year, some young schoolgirls learning to play the violin in Atham Rye. And just frankly, they were at an early stage of musical skill, but hearing live instrumentation after so many concerts from the New York Metropolitan, you know, coming down the line, I just thought, you know, the the physicality is something that we are missing at this time. Um, it, it, and the, there's, um, um, you know, a kind of hunger for the return to um, the analog in a, a, a certain way. Sorry, that's just a couple of places. Yeah. Anyone, anyone else want to respond to that on the panel? No pressure, but that's fine. But time's, time's moving on anyway. Uh, I just want to read a comment and then there's one final qu question unless there's any more comes in. Um, comment from Helen O'Connell. Uh, uh, Chi Chen's theme of disappearing while looking at individuals in a particular context has a strong collective resonance. Also the disappearance or fading away of what it is to be human through Alzheimer's and dementia, death, disappearing or changing form. So uh, thanks for that comment, Helen. And again, it's back to this question of materiality again. Um, let me just, uh, there was one more question. There was another couple of questions. That, uh, bear with me a second while I scroll. There's a question for Ling, uh, also from Brittany. Um, Ling, are you interested in EMDR in your videos? And what, I actually don't know what that what is um, means. EMDR? Yeah, uh, Brittany, can you put it in the chat? What is EMDR? <laughs> or anyone else who knows? Maybe she's gone. Is Brittany still here? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, here we go. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I'm uh, eye movement desensitization, desensitization. So using eye movement, uh, using eye movement to influence the viewer. Yeah. Uh, from Sam, it's also it's used as a therapeutic technique to treat uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. I think in my past work, I played. Um, I, on certain level, I play with this, and also with my sound work, I like to play with the location of the sound to like hit the heart or hit the brain. Uh, but with this piece, I haven't really thought about this, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't have like a clear answer for um, Brittany's question, but there's okay. there's a possibility um, because uh, I I I kind of played with uh, I play with this a lot not the eye movement but uh, the emotional um, kind of uh, tricks I played a lot with my past work especially like sound works. So yeah, there's a possibility, I think. Okay, well, thanks for that, uh, Ling, and thanks, Brittany, for that question, and for, for Helen and Sam for your, your input. Uh, we, we're over the allocated time um, at the moment, and uh, I think uh, we should probably move to wrapping yes. up. Anya, do you want to move to wrap it I up? I think we can call proceedings um, 
to an end and uh, just to thank all the participants and their excellent presentations are fascinating, really well articulated and very well presented. Thanks to Rod Stoneman for his extremely interesting responses and very useful um, reflections. Thank you to everyone who attended um, our community at the Burn College of Art here uh, in Ballyvaughan, but also uh, the general public, our friends and colleagues who I can see uh, had attended today. And it's wonderful even just to see your names popping up on our participants list. And I hope to, we hope to welcome you all back again here in the future to our exhibitions, our talks and events at the Burn College of Art. Um, and hopefully we can welcome you all in person, most importantly. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again in the future. So goodbye, everybody. Well, let's, let's unmute ourselves for one quick moment and give everyone a round of applause. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Well done. Well done, everyone. Stop Thank it. you. Bye-bye.